Okay, I'm finishing off my talks on Maoist dialectics with a rather longer section here. I'm going to look at Mao's emphasis on the particularity of contradictions and his approach to the hierarchy of contradictions and how this can be used to analyze the contradictions of late capitalist society. From the general to the particular, Mao, quoting Engels and Lenin in On Contradiction, was to a large extent making perfunctory gestures to orthodoxy. His innovation comes with his analysis of the particularity of conflicts, and it's here that he deployed an entirely new set of conceptual terms and meanings, turning the language of dialectics into a tool for military and political strategy. He starts out criticizing the dogmatists and emphasizing the scientific method. Uh, it's going from the particular to the general. His description of the scientific method is, there are two processes of cognition, one from the particular to the general and the other from the general to the particular. Thus cognition always moves in cycles and so long as a scientific method is strictly adhered to, each cycle advances human knowledge to a higher step and so makes it more profound. This cyclical process, Mao's description of the scientific method is essentially the same as that given by Newton. Newton says, all the difficulty of philosophy seems to consist of this, from the phenomena of motions to investigate the forces of nature, and from these forces to demonstrate other phenomena. Mao was describing in his terminology of contradictions the Newtonian scientific method. What Mao calls going from the particular to the general is what Newton means by from the phenomena of motions, the particular phenomena of motions that he could investigate in the lab. From that you go to the general, the general law of the forces which apply, the, the general laws of motion. And from those you can go back to the particular, the actual orbits of the planets. Now, he's contrasting himself to the Debornists, the dogmatic Debornists, who he says are lazy bones. They refuse to undertake any painstaking study of concrete things. They regard general truths as emerging out of the void, and they turn them into purely abstract, unfathomable form formulas, and thereby completely in deny, completely deny and reverse the normal sequence by which man comes to know truth. Nor do they understand the interconnection of the two processes of cognition, from the particular to the general, and then from the general to the particular. They understand nothing of the Marxist theory of knowledge. Does that seem familiar? In contrast to the dogmatic Hegelians today, in contrast to dogmatic Hegelians today are lazy bones. They refuse to take, undertake any painstaking study of concrete things. They regard general truths as emerging out of the void. They understand nothing of the Marxist theory of knowledge. They're lazy bones. They refuse to undertake any painstaking study of concrete things. They regard general truths as emerging out of texts and critique. If you look at the current equivalent of the Debornis, the Neumarx Lectur, 
what statistical analysis of current economic conditions and current class conflicts have the Neumarx Lector ever had undertaken? Precious little. From the particular to the general. Take the example of Mao's law, the falling rate of profit. It was our experience that only by means of concrete statistical analysis of the accumulation process which had taken place in the UK from the 1850s to the mid 20th century were we in communist formation able to deepen our understanding of the mechanisms by which it operated and come up with a precise mathematical description of the dynamical process of the falling rate of profit. Had we just tried to deduce things from accounts given in capital without the guidance of actual history, without the guidance of actual statistics, it's very unlikely we would have come up with the correct dynamic equations. Truth comes from practice. Without that equation, without the general law of motion, you can't grasp the limited and contradictory nature of the partial recovery of Western profitability that occurred in the last decade of the 20th century, nor can you understand the contrasting trends of capital returns in China and Africa, for example, since 2000. Indeed, unless you know the equations, unless you know the general law, you don't even know what question to ask about the rates of profit in Africa and China. Now, let's go back to Mao again. He says, there are many contradictions in the course of development of a major thing. For instance, in the course of China's bourgeois democratic revolution, where conditions are exceedingly complex, there exists the contradiction between all oppressed classes in Chinese society and imperialism. The contradiction between the great mass of the people and feudalism. The contradiction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The contradiction between the peasantry and the urban petty bourgeoisie on the one hand and the bourgeoisie on the other. The contradiction between various reactionary ruling group, groups and so on. So, in any society, there's a complex mass of class contradictions or class conflicts. Let's try applying that to the West. The same language of many contradictions provides a way of looking at the crisis of capitalism in the West, where one has to consider, for a start, the contradiction or class conflict between labour and capital expressed in the rate of surplus value. The contradiction between productive and unproductive labour. The higher the proportion of surplus value you use to pay wages of unproductive labour, the lower is the flow of surplus value that can be accumulated as new means of production. Next, the contradiction in capital and landed property, expressed as a rising share of surplus value going as rent. Finally, the contradictory effect of accumulation itself, by which, by raising the capital to labour ratio, tends to depress the profit rate. Now, formalising this, we can say that Mao's language of multiple contradictions in the process of the development of society provides a framework for thinking through these kinds of processes. On one hand, we can formulate it in mathematical terms, so that the contradictions themselves become mathematical expressions. So we have the rate of surplus value is S over V, the rate the mass of profit is given by surplus value minus unproductive wages minus rent. So, from these, you can, from the maths, you can extract the contradictions. You can express the conflict relations in the familiar language of dynamics and calculus. Consider the contradictory relation between accumulation and the rate of profit. We say contradictory relation. What do we mean by that? Okay, let's use pi for the rate of profit. And pi is equal to p, the mass of profit, as defined earlier, over k, which is the capital stock in any given year. So that applies to society as a whole. And we can express the rate of change of the capital stock with respect to time 
which is the derivative of k with respect to time. And that in turn is given by accumulation over capital. So that gives you the, the rate of change of the capital stock. And let the share of profit going as accumulation be alpha. So alpha is the accumulation as the share of profit. Now consider the rate of change of the rate of profit with respect to time. So how does the rate of profit vary with respect to time? So we'll, we'll you write that either in um, Leibniz in Newton's notation as um, pi dot or in Leibniz notation d pi by dt. That is to say whether the rate of profit tends to rise or fall over time. That's what we're concerned with because that's what the falling rate of profit is about. Now, it's clear from the previous equations that d pi prime over d alpha is going to be less than zero. That is to say the partial derivative of the rate of change of the rate of profit with respect to the rate of accumulation is negative. And this means that a high rate of accumulation tends to make the rate of profit fall. This is just going through using um, the familiar language of maths. Oops, something funny here. Yeah. Mao used the language of conflict and hierarchies of conflict. Now, I just expressed it there in the language of Newton and Leibniz, the language of mechanics. I could have expressed it in the language of cybernetics and spoken of negative feedback loops. All of these are just different tools for us to think through dynamical relationships existing in the material world. Now, as it happens, all the contradictions or conflicts in my earlier list actually involve negative partial derivatives, if you express them in maths since the derivative of the of profit relative to wages is negative. The derivative of profit relative to unproductive expenditure is negative. The derivative of profit relative to rent is negative. So there is something here about a negative derivative which is involved in the notion of a conflict or a contradiction. Those of you who are familiar with electronic circuits will know this sign here which is a sign for a not sign something for negation this is an actual circuit which implements negation in a CMOS chip almost all computer chips nowadays are CMOS what we have here is a PMOS transistor and an NMOS transistor if we have a high voltage on A it tends to block current flowing through here and enable current flowing through here so that not A gets pulled to ground. So a plus a positive voltage on A pushes the voltage on not A down to ground. So the derivative of the output with respect to change in the input voltage is negative. And this would be the case almost any way you tried to mechanize logic. So the you can view something in the real world that can be described with a negative um, differential to be poetically expressed as negation. So the association between negative partial derivatives and contradictions in dialectical materialism actually is based on a metaphor and a fairly straightforward metaphor at that. And it's because logic itself is just an abstraction that we apply when describing actual physical systems which implement logic. And it doesn't matter whether these physical systems are electrical circuits people with notepads applying, learned rules of Boolean algebra, 
or perhaps a, an entirely mechanical or fluidic logic system. Since the physical representation of negation will involve something involving negative partial derivatives, we can metaphorically or poetically apply the term negation to any material process governed by such negative derivatives. As I said in a previous talk, you have to understand Mao as often speaking poetically. Mao talks about resolution. Qualitatively different contradictions can only be resolved by qualitatively different methods. For instance, the contradiction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie is resolved by the method of socialist revolution. The contradiction between the great mass of the people and the feudal system is resolved by the method of democratic revolution. The contradiction between the colonies and imperialism is resolved by the method of national revolutionary war. The contradiction between the working class and the peasant class in socialist society is resolved by the method of collectivization. So, different types of contradiction have to be resolved specifically. Mao also talks about a principal contradiction. What does he mean by this? He means it's the contradiction which is most important in determining the course of current social development. And this notion of principal contradiction was essentially related to politics. He says, for capitalism, the two forces in contradiction, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, form the principal contradiction. And that's because these opposing classes in a mature capitalist society shape the entire structure of politics. The existence of that contradiction shapes the entire structure of politics. And he distinguished the principal contradiction, which is defined at the political level, from a basic or fundamental contradiction, which operates at the level of production relations and won't disappear until a given stage in the development of society has completed. Now again, when Marx and Engels applied the law of contradiction to things in, th in things, to the study of socio-historical process, they discover the contradiction between the productive forces and the relations of production. They discover the contradiction between the exploiting and exploited classes, and also the resulting contradiction between the economic base and its superstructure. And they discovered how these contradictions inevitably lead to different kinds of social revolution in different kinds of class society. Now apply this to modern capitalism. The conflict between the forces and relations of production gives, a fundamental con gives rise to a fundamental contradiction in the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. At the class level, this is expressed in the economic class struggle between workers employees and employers over wages, the working day, conditions of work, etc. And it's this contradiction which is the principal one overriding the class conflict, for example, between capitalist and landed property, or between industrial and finance capital. Understanding the relationship between the contradictions explains how the economic and political working out of a crisis can proceed. So long as the con for instance, principal contradiction at the political level is between the working class and the capitalist class, and that is not resolved by a socialist revolution, the basic economic contradiction will persist. So long as there hasn't been a socialist revolution, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall is not removed. And the laws of motion of a capitalist economy, which we can codify in a set of dynamical equations, mean that the crisis has a limited number of ways of being resolved. What are they? One, the rate of exploitation could be increased by holding down the wage share, that's relative surplus value, or extending the real working week, which is absolute surplus value. And we know that both of those things have been happening over the last 30 or 40 years in the developed capitalist countries. 
there can be a diversion the diversion of surplus into rent revenues which now include things like rents on intellectual property patents oil fields etc could be reduced by nationalizing land and nationalizing IPR for example and using the resultant revenue to fund public expenditure whilst cutting taxes on profits. That might be a rational thing for the industrial bourgeoisie to aim for. Alternatively, the size of the unproductive sector could be cut back. Or the rate of accumulation could be reduced and that's thus slowing or even reversing the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Well, as I say, this is British data during the neoliberal period, which roughly starts in the mid 1970s, the rate of exploitation has increased. In other words, the share of national income going in wages has fallen. So yes, exploitation has risen. And that's one possible way the ruling class can resolve their contradiction. But there are limits to this. They can't go on doing it indefinitely. It's worth having a look at this new book, How Labour Powers the Global Economy, by Makova, Fajun and Zachariah. And they show it's very hard for a capitalist economy to reduce the wage share far below 50%. It tends to be in the range 70 to 40 percent. It's much, it's really difficult for the bourgeoisie to keep reducing it. Now, what I'm saying is you, in a situation like this, we should use Mao's method of analysis because Mao's dialectics translates into a concrete analysis of capitalism in its neoliberal period. His emphasis on there being multiple contradictions, a hierarchy of contradictions, gives you a way of thinking it through within which formal mathematical statistical models of economic relations can be situated. You can take the formal mathematical models and draw political conclusions from them. And his emphasis on the particularity of contradiction, the need for concrete analysis, the way one contradiction overrides another allows one to see the possible forms of resolution of a crisis. And the challenge is to take this analysis of contradiction and develop a successful politics from it the way he was able to do. For example, I've talked about already about the way the bourgeoisie have attempted to increase the rate of surplus value. I said that one of the alternatives would be attacking rents, attacking various forms of rent income like landed property or IPR. But that's currently blocked by the interpenetration of the modern capitalist and rentier classes and their joint aversion to doing anything that might challenge the rights of private property. Mao calls this a matter of understanding each aspect of a contradiction. It's not enough to abstractly pose the rationally conflicting interests of capitalist firms and rentiers. You have to understand each aspect, how the capitalists and the rentiers and the extent to which these two classes overlap and both depend on the security of private property. Now, if it wasn't for the fear of the working classes, if it wasn't for the fear that the working class might th take things further and demand wholesale nationalizations, the conflict of interest between capital and landed property might have prompted the bourgeoisie to undertake radical land reform, like the George's program of full site value rating. Now, George's here is Henry George, but the last time this was actually even on the horizon, in Britain was under the Liberals and Lloyd George in the immediate period before 1914, for example. 
at that time you had the industrial bourgeoisie organized as a distinct political party the liberal party which was distinct from the rentier interest which was organized in the tory party and the industrial bourgeois party the liberal party attempted as their strategy to form a coalition between the industrial bourgeoisie and the rising working class but as time passed the principal contradiction became became between labor and capital and that overrode the secondary contradiction between capital and landed property and subsequently stifled any chance of land reform in fact in britain you largely got the extinction of the um, liberal party as a distinct political party representing the industrial bourgeoisie and the entire property interest switched to being represented by the Conservative Party. Now let's shift from the early 20th century to the end of the 20th century and more recent period. If it's not possible to attack landed property and if there are limits to the attack on labour what else can they do? They can either cut down the unproductive sector or they can slow down accumulation. And both of these things happen during the neoliberal period. But even here, the form of resolution is shaped by the interaction of contradictions because there are two broad categories of unproductive labor. On the one hand, there are those working in services which are consumed by the upper classes financial fund managers, tax consultants, banking, personal servants, etc., lifestyle consultants. Then there are those working in public services, which are consumed by the mass of the population and by the working population, education, public health, care, libraries, etc. From the point of view of industrial capital, all of these are unproductive. They don't contribute to accumulation. So there are two attacks which could have been carried out. It would have been in the interest of the mass of the people to cut the unproductive sector serving the property classes. It was in the interest of the bourgeoisie to cut the unproductive workers who provided public services. And this is an example of there being two contradictory paths to resolve a crisis and which one won out is decided by politics. We know that the bourgeois response was to cut or privatise the public services by converting workers who are working for the state into workers working for private capital. But that was determined by politics. It was determined by the weakness of the working class in parties in presenting an alternative. Successful working class politics has to form a coalition of class interests defined at the economic level that can unite all who can, can be united against the current principal enemy. That was the strategy that Mao applied. This doesn't mean that socialists have to put the immediate transformation of the economy into communism to the fore because what they should be doing is trying to form the right alliances to change the form of state power to a new democracy and there is the background image of Mao de declaring the People's Republic. <laughs> 